Or call the Rexburg police to report missing children? No, she did. Okay. Detective, if I say Nick Mick, do you know what that means? Yes, sir. What is that? It's an acronym for National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Did you contact them? We did. December 11th, we contacted Nick Mick and entered J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan as missing and endangered children. Okay. Did you ever alert the public that there was a search for J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan? Yes. When was that? Uh, that was December 20th, 2019. Uh, the police department gave a press release and tried to get those names out in public to assist us uh, in any way we can, in, in any way they could. Um, we also set up a tip hotline through NCMEC, through the FBI, and the Rexburg Police Department, so people with any tips or, or possible sightings of Tylee or JJ could call in, give us some information, and we would have officers or detectives follow up on each tip that came in. Okay. Did any of those tips lead to the location of J.J. Vallow or Tylee Ryan? No, they did not. Okay. Your Honor, if we could have a brief sidebar. Yes. May I continue? You may. <clears throat> Detective, are you aware, <clears throat> excuse me, if there was ever a child protection action filed regarding J.J. Vallow and Tylee, J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan? Yes, there was. What county was that filed in? Because we're going to object based on 404B. We previously... Uh, objected on this, and I know the court's ruled on that, but we just like that put on the record. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Uh, this does delve into some 404B issues, which were previously determined by the court in a ruling that was stated on the record on February 22nd, 2023. <coughs> and for the reasons I would incorporate into that uh, finding today, also incorporating the findings in that record, I'll overrule the objection, and you can continue this line of questioning, Mr. Wood. Thank you. Were you in, uh, what county was that filed in? Uh, Madison, I believe. Okay. Were you involved? Yes, I was. How so? I was the one who wrote the affidavit. Okay. Um, are you aware if Lori Vallow was ever ordered to produce her children to the Rexburg police? Yes, she was. Okay. Are you aware if she ever produced her children to the Rexburg police? She did not. Okay. Detective, through your investigation, were you ever able to locate the whereabouts of Lori Vallow and Chad Dayville? Yes, we were. How did you do that? Through cell phone data, uh, tips coming in through the hotline that we had set up. Um, we were, we were able to determine that they were in Kauai. Okay. Kauai is in the island of Hawaii. Correct. Okay. Or one of the islands in Hawaii. Uh, did you go to Kauai? I did. Uh, why did you go there? We went there to assist the Kauai Police Department uh, with the service of that court order. Okay. Uh, and do you know if she was served with that order? She was. Do you know what date? She was served on January 25th, 2020. Okay. Did you do anything else while you were there? We did. Uh, we also assisted 
Kauai Police Department with the search warrant of Chad Daybell, Lori Vallow's rental vehicle, as well as their uh, condo they were renting in Princeville. Okay, and, and to clarify, did you perform those searches? No, I did not. Who performed those searches? Kauai Police Department. Okay. Were you present uh, when their condominium was searched? I was, yes. Okay. Um, and did you go in after the search was performed? Yes, I did. Okay. <clears throat> did you find J.J. Vallow in that condominium? No, sir. Did you find Tyree Ryan? No. What did you observe in that condominium? Uh, normal furniture, uh, clothes, beds, uh, just appeared that two adult people were living there. Okay. And did you find any children's toys? No. Did you observe any children's medication? No. Uh, did you observe any children's clothes? No. Any teenage girl clothes? Nope. Okay. Did you see anything that would indicate that minor children had lived there? No. Or, excuse me, had been living there? No. Okay. You stated that uh, the rental car that Chad and Lori Daybell were using was searched as well? That's correct. Did you observe that search? I did. Okay. Um, did you aid in that search? No, sir. Okay, just observed it? Correct. Detective, I'm going to talk to you about the concept of proof of life. If I use the words proof of life, what does that mean? Any documentation that would be able to confirm if somebody was still alive. Okay. Um, did you ever, pursuant to your investigation, find a proof of, well, let me rephrase that. Pursuant to your investigation, what was the last date you are aware of, of proof of life for Tylee Ryan? September 8th, 2019. What was that proof of life? It was a photograph taken in West Yellowstone. Okay. Um, and were you able to identify who Tylee Ryan was in that photograph? Yes. Okay. Pursuant to your investigation, what was the last date you were aware of proof of life for J.J. Vallow? September 22nd, 2019. Okay. Uh, what was that proof of life? It was a photograph taken of JJ, <clears throat> excuse me, on sitting on a couch. Okay. In Defendant Vallow's front room. All right. Your Honor, may I suggest this would be a good time for the mid morning break? That's fine. We can go ahead and take our mid-morning break then. We will go for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then we will resume again uh, until the lunch break. I would remind the people in attendance here, please take your personal effects with you and don't leave any bags or other items on the tables when you go. So we'll be in recess. All right. Back on the record on case CR 22-21-1624, State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vallow. Just finished our mid-morning break. Uh, we'll have the jurors return, and you can continue your direct examination, Mr. Wood, of this witness.
All right, thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> okay, I'll remind the witness you're still under oath, and Mr. Wood, you can continue your direct examination. Thank you. Your Honor, I'm going to ask that the witness be handed what's been marked as States Exhibit A through D. Is there a number corresponding? I, I apologize. States Exhibit 9A through 9D. Thank you. Detective, can you look over those and let me know when you've had a chance to review them? Okay. Do you recognize States Exhibit 9A through D? Yes, I do. What, do, what does that exhibit <clears throat> purport to be? This is the 2018 Jeep Wrangler that I seized on November 4th, 2019. Okay. And are those images true and accurate representations of what you witnessed uh, with that Jeep? Yes, sir. Your Honor, I'd ask that States Exhibit 9A through D be entered into evidence. Any objection? <laughs> you may. Thank you. Uh, these photographs, were they taken uh, at a police station or somewhere, or were these taken at, uh, where, where were they taken? They were taken in our impound bay at the police department. Okay. And the red evidence tape that was put on at the police station when you got there? That's correct. Okay. How did it get to the police station? It was towed. Towed? Okay. And where was it taken from? 565 Pioneer, just outside of the garage of 175. Okay. Thank you. No, no uh, objection, Judge. All right, thank you, Mr. Thomas. So exhibits 9A through D are all admitted to evidence and may be published. Thank you. Detective, you testified about this Jeep earlier, so I realize we're going back a little bit. Can you describe what's shown in States Exhibit 9A? That is a, a photograph of the Jeep that I had seized, like I said earlier, from the to view of the passenger side of the Jeep. Okay. Nine B. Uh, that's the rear view of the Jeep with uh, Texas plates that we were told about by Gilbert. Okay. States Exhibit 9C. That's a photograph of the inside of the Jeep taken from the driver's door. And 9E. It's also a Photograph of the inside of the Jeep from the passenger side. Now, I'd ask that the witness be shown, states exhibits 8 and 8. Sorry, I'm not speaking. 
speaking into the microphone. I'd ask that the witness be shown states exhibits 8M and 8N again. All right, we'll have the bailiff deliver those to the witness. Detective, uh, you testified earlier about these documents that they were found in the garage of apartment 175, correct? That's correct. And that one of those doc, at least one of those documents is an email? That's correct. I asked you earlier who the email was from. Uh, can, can you read the email address that that document is sent from? Judge, I would object here. I would, I would ask the court to uh, take the, uh, the exhibit as it is. And um, the best evidence is the exhibit itself, not what, what can be read or what can't be read. In honesty, I can't read it. And I don't think, I don't know. I, don't I just don't think it's appropriate to have him read. Okay. I don't understand the objection. There's a photograph that's been admitted, uh, as I understand, through uh, prior offering and it's in evidence so to the extent the witness wants to address what's on the photograph it's permitted um, I don't know how hard it is to read or not I don't have it in front of me to me it looks like Chad Daybell at gmail.com okay thank you detective we had talked about before the break, proof of life. And you spoke about some photos. Your Honor, I'd ask that uh, this, the witness be handed States Exhibit 29A and States Exhibits 13 and 14. Detective, before I ask any questions about that, I'm going to ask a few questions. Are you familiar with an iCloud account, Lori for Style at iCloud.com? Yes, I am. Is this uh, an account that you have reviewed in the course of your investigation? Yes, I have. Okay. Uh, Detective, can you look at Exhibit 29A? What does that document purport to be? It's a business certification record of the custodian of records of an Apple account. Okay. Does it list the Apple account on that document? Yes, sir, it does. Okay. Does it state anywhere on that document if the record was made at or near the time 
or from information transmitted by someone with knowledge of that document. Yes, sir. Okay. Does it state anywhere if that document, if if those documents were kept in the regular uh, course of the business? Yes, it does. Okay. Uh, does it state that making those records was a regular practice of that business or of that activity? Yes. Okay. Is this document sw uh, excuse me, signed under penalty of perjury? Yes, it is. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd ask that States Exhibit 29A and the accompanying records be allowed into evidence. 29A is an exhibit. When you say the accompanying records, are you talking about uh, exhibit 14? Uh, 13 and 14, Your Honor. Okay. Which I can lay further foundation for. Well, let's start there with exhibit 29A. Is there any objection to exhibit 29A being introduced? Uh, there is, Your Honor. What's the objection? May I have wide air and aid of objection? You may. Okay. Who, whose signature is on the, the document there? Catherine Calvert. And is it an actual signature or is it a, a e signature? An e signature. Okay, so it's not her actual signature. Doesn't appear to be. No. Okay. Uh, have you talked to Catherine Calvert? I have not. No. In the course of your investigation, did you have an opportunity to contact anyone at Apple? I've spoken with people at Apple throughout the course of the investigation. Yes. Who? Off the top of my head, I don't I don't have a name. Not in reference to Catherine Calvert, though. Your Honor, I'm going to ask for a sidebar. All right. <clears throat> All right, thank you, Mr. Wood. Upon uh, discussing with counsel at sidebar, let me ask from the defense, is there any objection at this point to the admissions of Exhibit 29A and States 13 and 14? Uh, I don't have a copy of 13 and 14, but 29A is the business record, is that right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I don't have an objection to that. Okay, we'll start there then. Exhibit 29A is admitted into evidence, and you can continue your inquiry, Mr. Wood. Thank you. Detective Hermosillo, through the course of your investigation, have you reviewed the iCloud account? Lori for style at iCloud.com. Yes, I have. Uh, from reviewing that account, are you able to tell who it belongs to? Yes. Who did it belong to? Lori Vallow. How did you know that? Based on the records on the account. Okay. And the, the photographs and everything attached to it. Okay. Detective, can you look at State's Exhibit? I believe it was 13 and 14. Do you recognize those documents? I do. What do they purport to be? Photographs of JJ, Tylee, and Alex in Yellowstone. Also a photograph of J.J. Uh, sitting on a couch in red pajamas. Okay. And did you observe those photographs in that iCloud account? Yes, I did. And are those true and accurate representations of the photographs found in the iCloud account, in the Lori for Style iCloud account? Yes, they are. Your Honor, I'd move for admission of States Exhibits 13 and 14. Um, I'll take them up one at a time on Exhibit 13. Is there any objection? 13 is which one? The uh, Yellowstone photo? Yes. No objection. 
Exhibit 13 is admitted, uh, and Exhibit 14 is a photo of a uh, child on a couch. No objection. All right, Exhibit 14 is also admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. May I publish those to the jury? <clears throat> yes. <coughs> Mr. Thomas, you were able to see these courtesy copies before we published them, correct? Prior to publication, yes. Okay, thank you. You can publish them, Mr. Wood, if you'd like. Detective, uh, what do you observe in Space Exhibit 13? It's the photograph of J.J., Tylee, and Alex in Yellowstone. How do you know that's Yellowstone? I've, I've been there before. I recognize it. Okay. Detective, was there metadata associated with that photo? There was. Did it have a date? September 8th, 2019. Is that the same photo you referred to earlier when we were discussing proof of life? That's correct. Detective, what do you observe in States Exhibit 14? The picture of J.J. Vallow in red pajamas on the couch. Okay. Uh, is that the same picture we were speaking about earlier when we spoke about proof of life? Yes, sir. Does that picture have metadata with it? It does. Uh, what was the date on that picture? September 22nd, 2019. Thank you. And perhaps I should have asked, uh, what is metadata? It's just information uh, associated with the picture, date, time things like that. So, Detective, at this point, we've, sp we've spoken about your search for J.J. and Tylee. Uh, did any part of your investigation uh, include working with Fremont County? It did. Uh, did any part of your investigation involve Tammy Daybell? It did. Okay. Uh, as part of your investigation, did you learn that Tammy Daybell had died? Yes, I did. Do you know when she died? October 19th, 2019. Okay. And did you learn of any other incident regarding Tammy? Yes. What was that? Uh, she, that she was possibly shot at on October 9th, 2019, outside of their residence. Okay. Detective, as part of your investigation, did you help execute a search warrant on the Daybell residence? Yes, I did. When was that? June 9th, 2020. Uh, what is the address of that residence? 202 North, 1900 East, Fremont County. Okay. Now, just for clarification, it, what city is that listed in? <clears throat> it's listed in, in Rexburg. Okay. Um, but it's in Fremont County. Okay, because Rexburg is normally... In Madison County. Correct. Correct. Okay. As you executed that search warrant on June 9th, uh, what was the first thing you did? On June 9th, we got to Chad Daybell's residence at approximately 7 in the morning. Uh, we went and made contact, knocked on the front door. Uh, Chad Daybell's son, Mark Daybell, answered the door. He had a bowl of cereal in his hand. He was eating cereal. It was early in the morning. Um, and we informed Mark why we were there uh, and that we needed to speak with Chad Daybell. Okay. Uh, then what happened? Mark told us that his dad, Chad, was still asleep. 
and directed us to Chad's room, uh, which is a, it's like a loft room that was above the garage area. So we walked us through the house and to the stairwell of Chad's room. Okay. Uh, and what did you observe then? We walked up the stairwell, announced ourselves. Uh, Chad was still asleep in bed as we came around the little half wall. Uh, Chad sat up. Uh, we told Chad why we were there, that we had a search warrant, search the property in the residence. Uh, he asked if he can get dressed and get some clothes on. We allowed him to do that. And then he walked back downstairs with us into the kitchen area. Okay. Um, what happened then? Chad asked to contact his attorney, and at that time it was Mark Means. Uh, Chad was allowed to contact his attorney. Uh, he spoke on the phone with his attorney in the kitchen area. Um, his attorney asked to speak with one of our detectives, but was referred to speak with the prosecutor at that time. Okay. What happened after that? After that, we went into the front room where Chad was given a copy of the search warrant. Uh, he sat in the recliner closest to the door. Uh, he reviewed the search warrant. His children at that time were sitting on the couch across from him. Um, he asked if he needed to leave or his children needed to leave, and we explained to them they didn't need to leave. They were free to stay, but if they stayed, they would be accompanied by an officer for safety reasons. Um, at that point, his children stated they were going to go, and Chad stated he didn't know whether he was going to go or not, um, but asked to go make a phone call out in his vehicle that was parked in the driveway. Okay. Uh, what did you do then? At that time, the children were allowed to leave. Uh, we walked outside in the front yard area. Uh, Chad got into the uh, driver's seat of a vehicle that was backed into the driveway. He was on the phone talking. Uh, in the meantime, there were the FBI ERT team, the evidence recovery team, arrived on scene along with other detectives now that the scene was safe to arrive. Um, and they began marking off different areas in the backyard, uh, just setting up for the search warrant and what we needed to do that day. Okay. Who, who aided, <clears throat> who was a part of serving that search warrant that day in terms of law enforcement? The FBI, uh, the FBI evidence re recovery team, Fremont County Sheriff's Office, Rexburg Police Department, the Idaho Attorney General's Office. Uh, I believe that was it. And did you assist in the actual search that day? Yes, I did. Okay. You spoke about Mr. Daybell or Chad Daybell sitting in a vehicle in his driveway, correct? Correct. Were you able, did you observe him, uh, were you able to observe his behavior during that time? I was. Uh, Mr. Debo was sitting in the driver's side facing west. Um, he was on the phone. And while he was on the phone, he had the phone in his right hand. He was intently looking over his right shoulder. Um, he would talk for a second, look back over his right shoulder watching what was going on behind him to his left, to his right, excuse me. So we positioned ourselves to see exactly what Mr. Debo was concerned or, or looking at. Uh, and when we positioned ourselves that way, we could see Mr. Debo uh, 
Your Honor, I'm going to object. This, this, is, this is information that's calling for speculation, and he's speculating about what Mr. Daybell was seeing at the time. Your Honor, I'm going to, I can ask some more questions. All right. The objection is sustained, but nothing to strike on the response yet. If you'll ask another question, Mr. Williams. At any time, did you uh, go stand by where Mr. Daybell was sitting? We did. Okay. Uh, did you speak with him at all? We did. Uh, what did you say to him? I asked Mr. Debell if he needed a coat. Because um, at that time he was getting out of the vehicle. Okay. Uh, you testified that he had been looking over his shoulder. Correct. Uh, and that you perceived he was looking in a specific direction. Correct. When you went and stood by where Mr. Debell was, did you look in the direction that it appeared he had been looking in? I did. What did you observe when you looked in that direction? I observed the tree and the pond area on that side of the property. Okay. After that, uh, what did you do to aid in the search of Chad Daybell's property? We were given certain tasks by the head of the FBI ERT uh, to do different things. There were multiple people there. Um, so at that point, my original task was to sift through the fire pit that was located on the property. And what was the purpose of that? To see if there were there was anything of evidentiary value in the fire pit. Okay. You spoke about a pond area. Did you observe any activity activity uh, by the search team in the pond area that day? Yes, I did. When did that start? Wait. Time wise. Yes. Roughly 9 o'clock, maybe, Okay. in the morning. And what did you observe? While we were sifting through uh, the fire pit, there were a lot of people going towards the pond area underneath the tree, and so we were called over uh, to assist in that location. One moment. <clears throat> Your Honor, I'm going to ask that uh, the witness be hand states exhibit 10A, which will be offered as a demonstrative exhibit. Just that for now. Detective Hermosillo, do you recognize states exhibit 10A? Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, did you produce State's Exhibit 10A? I did. What tool did you use to do that? Google Earth. Okay. And do you recognize the property in 10A? Yes. Okay. Uh, was the purpose of producing that to aid the jury in uh, understanding the various locations you're talking about today? That's correct. Okay. And is that a... You have visit. Have you been on that specific property? Yes, sir. And is that a true and accurate representation of uh, the Dayville property? Yes, sir. Your Honor, I ask that State's Exhibit 10A be entered for demonstrative purposes to aid the jury in understanding these locations. Any objection? Uh, may I aid in, a, in an objection, Judge? May I vote here? Yes. 
so you indicate that you are depicting this as a true and accurate uh, depiction of the property. Have you ever done a flyover of this property? No. Okay. Uh, so you've never seen the aerial view of what this property looks like? Not the aerial view, no. But I've I've walked the perimeter of that property several times. And you looked up? I would imagine I would have looked up at some point. And you saw the sky? Probably. And you don't know what it looks like from the sky, right? That's correct. Okay. I'm going to object, Judge. This is He doesn't have uh, the <coughs> proper personal, uh, he doesn't have the foundation to be able to say that this is what it is, what it purports to be. All right. What's the response from the state on the objection? Your Honor, uh, the detective himself has been on the property multiple times. <coughs> Uh, as he's testified, uh, he was able to produce this just using Google Earth. Uh, and it's sim again, it's simply to aid the jury in uh, the location of, of the, the items he'll be discussing today. Uh, for demonstrative purposes, I think the state, I, I think he is more than laid adequate foundation for that document to come in. All right. The objections overruled. The court does find there's been sufficient foundation laid to introduce this, not for evidentiary purposes, but for demonstrative purposes to assist the jury in uh, reviewing or referring to locations. So for that limited purpose, the exhibit is admitted, um, states 10A. Detective, earlier you had talked about the front driveway. Is that? Can you see where I'm pointing with my pen? Jackson yeah. is leading, Judge. <clears throat> I'm Over, just overruled. I'm just asking a question. Is this the leading question? I'm, I'm objecting. To the I way. overruled it, Mr. Okay. Collins. Is this the front driveway you spoke of earlier? That's correct. Okay. Um, to your knowledge, is all of the property in this picture Chad Daybell's property? Yes. Okay. Is this the home? Can you see where my pen is pointing? Yes. Is this the home you went into when you made contact with Mr. Daybell that day? Yes. Okay. Is this the pond area that we you referred to earlier yes it is and you mentioned a tree by it is, is this that tree yes it is thank you detective you uh, you talked about activity going on there did did you go over to that area I did okay and what did you observe happening there initially uh, we had located a an area of concern because there was uh, longer grass and and weeds that were longer than about a four by two section where there was there was shorter grass and just a little bit of dirt showing. So initially, that's what caught our attention in that area. Okay. Uh, what happened there? Uh, the evidence recovery team began doing their thing as far as marking it off um, and, and getting it ready to, to excavate. Okay. Did you witness that excavation? I did. <laughs> um. As that excavation took place, uh, what did you observe? I observed uh, the ERT team remove the top layer of soil in that area. Um, 
as they began removing the top layer of soil, it began to expose three large white rocks. Uh, and at that point, uh, there was a strong odor of, uh, through my training experience, that was a decomposing body. Okay. Is that something you've smelled before? Unfortunately, yes. Okay. Uh, did they uncover those rocks? They did. Under under the the three large rocks, there was two pieces of wood paneling, thin wood paneling, um, under the under the rocks. Okay. Um, were those removed? They were removed. Okay. What happened after that, or what did you observe after that? Once we removed the, the wood paneling, there were, you could definitely see a difference in soil. Uh, the soil began to look moist. Um, so you had a, a definite distinction between the soil on the outside and the soil in the middle of this area where we began excavating. Um, and so the ERT team slowly, methodically started brushing away the, the moist soil where we were at okay and I, I just want to ask you a clarifying question were you physically aiding in the excavation not then I was not no okay uh, were you watching the evidence for the FBI team do that yes I was watching them do that. once those panels were well you've already testified to that uh, what what did you observe next? They began removing the soil. Once they started removing the soil, slowly and methodically, we began to see a black, round uh, object starting to protrude through the dirt. Um, just just a few inches deep. It wasn't very deep at all before we saw the, the the round object. It appeared, looking at it, it appeared to be like a, a texture of a plastic bag. Okay. Uh, did they continue to uncover that? They did. What did you observe? They scraped away some more soil uh, around that round object. And it began to take the shape of the crown of, it looked like the crown of a head protruding through the dirt. Okay. What action was taken next? Uh, we continued, or they continued to dig around that, what we started to call the burial site, um, and eventually exposed uh, what appeared to be a small, body wrapped in black plastic. Okay. Uh, at any time, was that plastic cut into? The top of the plastic was cut into where uh, where it had been exposed on the crown of the head, yes. Okay. And do you know what the purpose for that was? <clears throat> uh, we wanted to see exactly what it was without uh, manipulating or damaging any of the evidence. So the ERT leader, Steve Daniels, used a, a sharp instrument, made a slit down the, the top of the plastic. Uh, it exposed a piece of white plastic underneath that. Uh, a slit was made in the white plastic and eventually we were able to see that it looked like brown human hair. Okay. What did you observe yeah. at that point? At that point, we were then told that Chad Daybell was uh, leaving his daughter's residence at a high rate of speed. His daughter lives Caddy Corner to his residence. Um, so we were told he was leaving at a high rate of speed. Um, and at that time, uh, Chad Daybell was 
pulled over and taken into custody. Okay. At that time, did you re uh, return to what you referred to as the burial site by the tree? Yes, I did. Okay. What did you observe after that? <clears throat> Eventually, all the dirt was removed from the the small body wrapped in plastic. Um, the body was then uh, photographed. ERT took their measurements. Uh, the body was eventually removed from the burial site and put into a black body bag, which was locked for evidence purposes and placed in the back of the coroner's vehicle on scene. I want to ask you a clarifying question. Uh, you're referring to a body. <clears throat> Had you, other than the slit in the head area, you, testi you testified correct that this, bo this body was in a black plastic bag? Correct. correct. Did you remove any of the other black plastic at that time? No, it was just, when I testified to that, it was just the shape of a small body wrapped in black plastic. Okay. And you state, uh, what was done with that after it was removed from that site? It was placed in the back of the coroner's vehicle uh, and driven to the morgue uh, by the Fremont County coroner and a Fremont County deputy. Uh, myself and Lieutenant Ron Ball followed behind that vehicle all the way until we got to the morgue where it was turned over. Okay. Uh, after you took that uh, body to the morgue, what did you do? We went back to the Daybell residence uh, to assist with with further excavation. Okay. Was there another area that was searched in on the Daybell residence that day? There was. And if I could ask, is there a, a pointer that the witness can use? I think we do have a laser pointer available. This way. For the record, Mr. Woodwin, there is pointing. If you would just verbally describe what's being pointed out, that'll help it be clear later when it's read. Thank you. Um, Detective, uh, before we move on, can you uh, use the pointer to point to the area we've recently been dis discussing? Objection vague. Can you discuss the whole to property, the area Judge? Where Hang on a sec. Pending objection. Sorry. Overruled. You can inquire. Okay. Well, and to clarify, can you point to the area where the body was found in black plastic? There is a tree right here. On this side of the tree, just underneath, uh, the body was found in black plastic just underneath that tree. Okay. Thank you. You had mentioned a fire pit earlier. Yes, sir. Can you point to where that is? The fire pit is right around here. Okay. All right. So you testified you went up to... Uh, the morgue at the hospital, and you, at that point, you came back to the Daybell residence on June 9th, correct? Correct. Uh, and I had asked if there was another area being searched that day. Can you point to where that other area is? Right here. Okay. Could you describe that, Mr. Yes. Wood, please? Can you, can you describe where you're pointing? So through the course of our investigation, it was brought up that uh, that was known to the Daybell family as the Pet Cemetery. And uh, they described the Pet Cemetery as having a little black dog statue that was right next to the Pet Cemetery. So that's how we knew it as the Pet Cemetery. And here there's a black dog statue, and so 
this was the pet cemetery area. Thank you. And what did you observe when you returned uh, from the morgue? When I returned, they were, had already, the ERT team had already began excavating a part of that pet cemetery. Um, they had dug down a little bit, um, not too much, and that's when I arrived back on scene. Okay. And what did you do at that point? At that point, uh, I walked over to the pet cemetery area. I began observing. Um, in digging down, they located uh, items of interest that we needed to slow down and, and dig more methodically. So at that point, uh, a few of us got on our hands and knees and began digging um, around this, this uh, moist section of dirt. Okay. Uh, and then what did you observe? As we began digging, uh, we were on our hands and knees. Um, we started to uncover uh, just burnt flesh, um, charred bone. Um, the, the smell was, uh, again, of a decomposing body. Um, we had to take turns digging because the smell was so bad. We could only dig for a couple minutes. Um, so we slowly began digging that. You, when you say slowly, uh, what tools were you using to dig? Paint brushes. Um, little trowels, just something so we can get just a little bit of dirt up without damaging anything in the ground. Okay. And what did you find in that spot? <clears throat> Eventually we uncovered uh, bits and pieces of Tylee, who we assumed was Tylee. Um, that had been burned. Uh, there were pieces of bone, like I said, charred, charred flesh. Um, uh, just the best I can describe is just globs of 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 flesh that were falling apart. Okay. And did you keep digging down? We did. Did you find anything further? Once we removed some of that, uh, underneath there was another um, round uh, glob of, and, and sorry for the, that's the best way I can describe it, um, just burnt flesh, bone, all kind of what appeared to be in a, in a, in a put in a green bucket um, the bucket had melted so it was kind of uh, disformed and and the flesh and bone and um, was was all kind of stuffed in that melted bucket um, and so we began digging around that as well okay um, and what happened as you did that? <clears throat> we were able to, like I said, we were only able to work a couple minutes before we'd have to get switched out by their detectives. Um, we were able to get down all the way to the bottom of the mass, and what the goal was was try to get to the bottom be able to lift it onto a tarp or a body bag. Um, as we got down to the bottom, um, there was a partial human skull underneath the melted bucket. Okay. 
did you attempt to lift it out? We did. What um, happened? There were three or four of us that kind of climbed in this little hole. And we attempted to lift it out, but it kind of broke apart because it wasn't really being held in by anything. Um, and so it kind of broke apart and we had to go in and pick up the pieces out of the hole and put them back into the body bag. Okay. Detective, uh, at this point in your search, was this still on June 9th or was this another day? June 9th. Uh, at any point, uh, did you have to stop working on June 9th? We did. Uh, it was getting late in the evening. <clears throat> um, and so we ended up just deciding to secure the scene and be done for the day. Okay. And when you say secure the scene, what did that mean? Well, the scene was roped off with crime scene tape. Um, there were several officers from Rexburg Police Department, uh, Fremont County Sheriff's Office, um, that were scheduled to be there all night to watch the scene. We had two big light trucks that were uh, given to us by the fire department, also Fremont County Sheriff's Office, to illuminate the scene all night to make sure that the scene wasn't compromised throughout the night. Okay. And so the search continued on June 10th? Correct. Uh, what did you observe on June 10th? We went back to that second burial site where Tylee was buried, um, continued to excavate, uh, get all the pieces and parts out of that hole that um, we needed to get out. Um, we dug down once we got all the pieces and, and the and the bones and flesh out of the hole. Uh, we dug down a little further um, because the ground was still moist, the soil was still moist, so we wanted to make sure we got everything. Um, there were bits and pieces that we found. Once we dug down more, there were there were teeth and um, different parts a little bit further down, but um, we just finished with that, and then Tylee was also put into a body bag and transferred to the morgue in the same manner that we took J.J. And was that at the morgue at Madison Memorial Hospital? It was. In Rexburg, Idaho? Correct. Okay. After those remains you've discussed were recovered. What was the next part of your investigation? At that point, uh, once we got Tylee out of the ground, uh, we determined that we were going to take JJ and Tylee to the Ada County Coroner's office to get ready for an autopsy the next day. So that point they were picked up JJ and Tyler were picked up for the morgue by uh, the Fremont County Coroner Brenda Dye and Detective Kai Kamanu who drove the, the coroner's vehicle and myself and Lieutenant Ron Ball followed behind that vehicle all the way to Boise uh, where they were dropped off at the Ada County Coroner's office and I'm sorry what date was that it was June 10th Okay. Um, did anything else happen on June 10th? Uh, no. Okay. Your Honor, can I have a quick sidebar? Yes. Mr. Wood, you can continue your inquiry. 
Thank you, Your Honor. I'd ask that the witness be handed what's been marked as State's Exhibit 10B through 10L. Detective, if you can review those and let me know when you're done. Okay. Do you recognize those documents? I do. What do they purport to be? Uh, photographs taken. Uh, that day at the search warrant at Mr. Daybell's property. Uh, what day was that? June 9th, 2020. Okay. And you were present that day? That's correct. All right. Uh, and do you recognize each of those individual photos? Yes. Are they true and accurate representations of what you witnessed that day? They are. And Your Honor, the state would move for admission of state's exhibit uh, 10... B through, I believe, through L. Any objection? May I have one, Aaron Nate? You may. <clears throat> so, uh, 10B, that is a photograph of, uh, what is that? Is that, what is that? That's the front of Mr. Daybell's residence. Okay. And you didn't take that photograph? I did not. But you recognize the front of the residence? That's correct. Okay. Uh, 10 C, what is that? That is a photograph of the fire pit. You didn't take that photograph? No, sir. Was that taken on the day that you were there? It was. Okay. Did you see the photograph being taken? I did not. Your Honor, I'm going to object on relevance. Uh, these don't go to foundation. He's already laid an adequate foundation. Is there a objection you're considering that's based on foundation? Or what's the, what's the basis of this line of four dark? Well, I, I don't know when these were taken. I don't know who took them. And he's saying that all this happened and he saw all of it happen. Okay. Well, we'll just go through them individually then take an objection one by one. So uh, what's the objection on 10B? 10B, no objection. All right, 10B is admitted. Let's move on to 10C, which has been offered. Is there an objection? No, no objection. All right, 10C is admitted. 10D, is there an objection to that photograph? Uh, no. All right, D, 10D yes. is admitted. 10E? Is there an objection to that? 10E, yes, there's an objection. What is the objection? I don't know I don't know what this is. It's just a photograph of a piece of some grass. All right, Mr. Wood, response. On Detective, 10... do you have photographed a, uh, 10E in front of you? I do. Okay. Uh, what does that purport to be? That is the... What I earlier testified to with the long grass and the short grass and a little bit of dirt sticking out where J.J. Valla was eventually uncovered, that's the location. And do you know where this location is? Yes. Can you point to it on the demonstrative exhibit 10A? And what are you pointing at? It's just the east side, northeast side of the tree next to the pond area. Okay, and the image depicted in 10E, you saw that with your own eyes? That's correct. Is that a true and accurate representation of what you witnessed that day? Yes, it is. State moves again for admission of 10E. Any objection? Without foundation, Your Honor, no objection. All right, thank you, Mr. Thomas. So 10E will be admitted. What's next to look at 10F? Is there an objection to that? There is, Your Honor. I don't know what that is either. All right. Mr. Wood, if you'd lay some extra foundation on that one, please. Detective, do you have State's Exhibit 10F in front of you? I do. What does it purport to be? That's the exact same location as 10E. 
except with the topsoil uncovered. Okay. Uh, and is that a true and accurate representation of what you witnessed that day? It is. Thank you, Your Honor. Based on what he's just stated and, and the foundation he laid for the previous photograph, we'd move for the uh, admission of what number are we on? 10? 10 F. 10 F. Any objection? Yes, Your Honor. I may have my dear need of an objection. Uh, briefly, Mr. Thomas, yes. Thank you. So you indicated that you were working at the fire pit, which would have been 10 C, uh, when other people were working on the uh, burial site of JJ. Is that correct? No, that's not correct. Okay. So I was working at the fire pit. Um, then we were called down to the area of the pond area because they had located that original spot from 10E. So when I got there, that's when I got there is 10E. Okay, and you remained there throughout the time when they found uh, what was purported to be JJ's body? That's correct. Okay. I have no objection, Your Honor, Your Honor. Oh, okay. Okay. to the remainder. All right, no of the, objection uh, of to the, the remainder. Tickets. All right, so, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, then, Mr. Thomas, without objection, 10F will be admitted, 10G, 10H, 10I, 10J, 10K, and 10L are all admitted into evidence. Mr. Wood, you can continue your examination. Thank you. <clears throat> Detective, can you uh, describe what you observed? in States Exhibit 10B that morning. That's the, the front of Mr. Daybell's residence. Uh, he was parked in a vehicle just in front of this vehicle backed in. So that's not the vehicle that, that Mr. Daybell was sitting in, but parked in front of that one backed in. Okay. Um, and is that the area where you went uh, where you observed him looking over his shoulder. That's correct. And you testified that you went to that same location uh, to see where he was looking, correct? Correct. Uh, can you use the pointer and show what you saw when you did that? So when I was standing next to Mr. Daybell's vehicle, it was in this location here. Everybody see that pointer? Your Honor, I wonder if we could dim the lights a little bit. Yes. <laughs> I was standing in this location on the driver's side. He was back then on the driver's side of Mr. Daybell's vehicle. And when I was looking this way, it was directly to this tree here, which is where JJ was located just underneath this tree. Thank you. Detective, what did you observe in State's Exhibit 10C? That's the fire pit uh, where I was originally tasked to work. Um, in the fire pit, we also located uh, burnt bone fragments and teeth. What do you observe in States Exhibit 10D? That's standing at the, the west side of the property facing east. Oh, where is it? 
And this tree is the tree that JJ was buried underneath, just on the other side of this tree. Your Honor, I'm, I'm concerned that the pointer isn't very visible. We probably have another one. Is there a backup pointer we've got? Maybe. And if not, would it be possible for the, the witness to stand at the picture and point? Pretty. Just a moment. I think we can get one rounded up here. While we're waiting on a quick break here for that pointer, if anybody would like to stand up, stretch their legs, that's certainly fine. You can do that. Please be seated. <clears throat> Go ahead, Mr. Wood. Did, um, can I inquire? Did we get another pointer? We yes. Did. Can we just ask detect? Okay. That's much better. Thank yes. you. I appreciate that. All right, Detective Fermacio, I'm going to ask again, uh, what did you observe in State's Exhibit? 10D. This is standing on the west side of the property facing east. Uh, the tree in the photograph is uh, where JJ was buried underneath. And he was just buried right underneath, right there where that pointer is. Okay. Pointer is, I'm sorry. Detective, can you just uh, describe what you observed in State's Exhibit 10E? That's the photograph that when we were originally working at the fire pit, we were called over. Uh, that's directly underneath the tree. Um, and as I earlier testified, the difference in weed growth um, and the level of, of grass and a little bit of dirt showing um, brought our attention over there. So that's what we originally had seen. Okay. Uh, just due to the, the lighting, can you use the pointer to sh uh, point out uh, those things you were talking about where the grass is longer, where it's shorter? The grass is longer up here and it's shorter through here. Thank you. What did you observe in State's Exhibit 10F? That's after, this is a photograph of after we had removed the topsoil. Uh, you can see we started to, just the first little layer of topsoil, once it re was removed, you could see the beginning of the white rocks starting to protrude through the, the top of the dirt there. What did you, let's see. What did you observe in State's Exhibit 10G? This is a photograph of once that topsoil was removed, the the three white large rocks, the small rock. You can see uh, right here is uh, part of the wood paneling I described earlier uh, underneath the rocks. We also noticed that the roots were cut uh, along the burial site. Um, 
So just to clarify, uh, the excavation team did not cut those roots? That's correct. They were already cut. What did you observe in State's Exhibit 10-H? This is a photograph. Once we remove the large white rocks, uh, the wood paneling that was underneath them, thin wood paneling. Okay. Uh, you had testified earlier about a smell. Correct. Uh, were you able to... Uh, notice that smell at this point in the excavation? Absolutely. As soon as we removed the top soil, we were able to smell. Okay. Did you observe in State's Exhibit 10I? This is a photograph of when the wood paneling was removed. As I testified earlier, the, the soil began to look different. It began to look moist. Um, and we started to see that black plastic round object starting to show through the dirt. Can you use the pointer to point out that? So this is the, the, the moist soil that we started to see, and this is the black, round plastic that started to come through. Can you tell the jury what you observed in State's Exhibit 10J? Once we started to slowly excavate more of the soil, uh, we were able to uncover a little bit more of the, the round plastic. And this is where we, it looked like to be the crown of a, of a head sticking through the dirt. What did you observe in State's Exhibit 10K? Once we saw the crown of the head sticking through the dirt, uh, a, a small, sharp instrument was used to cut through the plastic, just enough to expose what was underneath. Um, after we cut through the black plastic, there was another layer of white plastic underneath that. We cut through that, and that's when we were able to see what appeared to be brown human hair uh, sticking out from the white plastic. So there's pieces of hair uh, on top of the, the white plastic that have kind of that fell off of the head. Um, also, you can see part of the black plastic starting to take shape uh, in the burial site. And what do you observe in State's Exhibit 10L? This is where we removed the dirt off of the plastic. Um, it's in the shape of a, a small human body that looks to be in the black plastic. Um, and at that point, this is where we removed um, JJ and placed him in a body bag and into the coroner's vehicle just as, as is. And what did you observe in State's Exhibit 10M? After we removed JJ, um, there was still moist soil. Second, counsel, I apologize. Which exhibit are we on now? 10M. We stopped at L, I think. Oh. with what was previously moved and admitted. And I don't think I have a courtesy copy of M yet. Oh, I do. 
apologies. So this has not yet been admitted. Okay. Your Honor, if this could be handed back up to the uh, witness and I'll. All right. The witness we handed exhibit states 10M. Detective, do you recognize states exhibit 10M? Yes. Um, do you recognize that? Uh, what does that document purport to be? Uh, the little site where we took JJ out of. Okay, and uh, were you uh, were you there the day that photograph was taken? That's correct. And did you observe that with your own eyes? But yeah, I helped lift him out of the burial site. Is that photograph a true and accurate representation of what you witnessed that day? Yes, it is. Your Honor, the state moves for uh, admission of <coughs> State's Exhibit 10M. Any objection? No. All right, Exhibit 10M, 10M is admitted, and you can publish it, Mr. Wood. Thank you. Detective, what do you observe? in State's Exhibit 10M. Uh, that's the moist soil that was underneath JJ once we removed him. Uh, that's just from the body breaking down, body decomposition. Um, so we dug further than that moist soil just to make sure we got everything and, and that's what that's a photograph of. Okay. Did you find anything else buried there? No. Okay. Just one moment, Your Honor. Let me have a brief sidebar, please. I just had a brief sidebar with the council discussing our scheduling for today. Uh, given the nature of the evidence we're about to go into and the time of the day, I'm going to suggest that we end up taking our lunch break at this time. Uh, we'll take a little longer lunch than typically we would, so we'll try to start back up here at 1245, so a little over an hour, and uh, we will be in recess until then. So please rise for the drink. Your Honor, before we start, they just brought Lori up. Can we have a, a minute to talk to her, either in the back hallway or downstairs? You may. Yeah, uh, let's go ahead and we'll just continue the lunch recess a little bit. If you'd like to exit with your client, we'll do that, and then we'll go back on the record. Thank you. Please be seated. Okay, we're back on the record on case CR 22-211624, State versus Lori Noreen Vallow. We broke for lunch and had a long lunch break. Legal issues arisen that the court 
did take up a sidebar with counsel off the record, uh, have been advised of a situation that needs to be argued and determined outside of the presence of the jury at this time. So, Mr. Uh, Archibald, Mr. Thomas, I'm aware that your client would have a request at this time. I need to consider that request and hear argument from the state. We'll make a determination and then proceed forward uh, regardless of the determination with additional evidence today. So, uh, Mr. Is, would it be Mr. Thomas or Mr. Archibald making the motion at this time? I will, Your Honor. All right. Mr. Archibald, if you'd like to make your motion at this time, you may. Your Honor, uh, my client wishes to waive her presence at the testimony for the remainder of the day. Uh, it was emotional this morning, and uh, she indicated to us she did not want to attend this afternoon. There is a, a rule that contemplates a defendant waiving their presence. I would ask the court to review that rule and any relevant case law. Uh, we would remind the court of the history of this case with my client, her uh, fragile state of mind, the mental health concerns, the myriad reports that have been filed uh, about her mental health do uh, justify such a request. All right. Thank you, Mr. Archibald. Uh, who's going to respond on behalf of the state? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I will be responding for the state. Your Honor, Idaho Rule 43 favors a defendant being present for the duration of trial. While there are some exceptions outlined in doing some quick research, case law indicates that there is no absolute right for a defendant not to be present. They do, however, have an absolute right to be present at trial. In addition, case law is clear, as well as Idaho Rule 43, that a court can require the defendant's present. Similarly, to the extent that a court can order a disruptive defendant to be bound and gagged and remain in court, it is clear this is how important it is to have a defendant present for the proceedings. Further, the state of Idaho also has a right to have the defendant present for the duration of trial. This isn't the first time that this court has dealt with the defendant's refusal to participate in the proceedings or come out for proceedings. We respect that this is that it is the court and not the defendant that controls the proceedings and how they move forward. If this court is to consider the request of the defense counsel for the defendant not to be present, the state would request that this court conduct an inquiry with the defendant on the record. I think case law is clear that that is a requirement in order for a finding that the defendant does not do, need to be present. But I would again indicate case law is very clear as well as Rule 43 that this court could override the defendant's request not to be present and require her presence in the courtroom. Further, if the court is to have the inquiry and determine that the defendant is going to be allowed to refuse to participate in certain portions of the proceedings, the state would request a jury instruction reflecting such that it was due to no fault of the state but that the defendant chose not to be present for certain portions or certain evidence being presented. We would further request that, this, that we receive a ruling today that the state will absolutely be able to comment during closing arguments on the defendant's refusal to be present during the showing of certain evidence. And we would ask that that ruling go into effect for any further portions of the trial outside of just today if the court were to allow the defendant not to be present and we run into this issue again, that would be an ongoing request from the state. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Blake. Um, Mr. Archibald, having heard the state's argument, is there any rebuttal argument? I think uh, jury instructions at this point would be premature. So uh, typically there's a jury instruction conference at the end of the case. So I'd ask the court to reserve ruling on that matter. All right. Thank you, Mr. Archibald. All right. Well, this issue came up over the lunch hour. I've spent some time with my staff attorney also researching the issue. I've heard argument from counsel, and I appreciate you taking the time to quickly research that issue. Um, 
I am prepared to make a ruling. So Idaho Criminal Rule 43 is the rule that deals with the presence of the defendant. In addition, a defendant has the right to be present at their trial as secured by both the United States Constitution and the Idaho Constitutions. And there is some authority out there about a voluntary or involuntary absence after trial started. So walking through the rule, presence is required under 43A, subsection 3, at every stage of the trial, including the impaneling of the jury and the return of the verdict. And then there's a set of presence not required list under 43B, which don't apply here. And then Part C is waiving continued presence. So the rule does have some contemplation about presence being waived. And that states in general, a defendant who was initially present at trial or other proceedings waives the right to be present under the following circumstances. The first circumstance, Part A, when the defendant is voluntarily absent after the trial has begun, regardless of whether the court informed the defendant of an obligation to remain during trial. The rule goes on to talk about the waiver's effect under Part C2. If the defendant waives the right to be present, the proceeding may continue to completion, including the verdict's return and sentencing during the defendant's absence. There's one case in Idaho, fairly recent from 2021, called State v. Crop, 168 Idaho 948. And that goes through an analysis of the defendant's presence. It states that the right to be present at trial is secured by both the United States Constitution and the Idaho Constitution. Like other constitutional rights, the right to be present can be waived. A defendant, after having been present at the trial's inception, can waive this constitutional right through a later voluntary absence. And then it talks about a three-step process to determine whether an absence is voluntary or not. Most of the cases on this issue deal with people who were there for part of their trial and then just failed to show up, maybe for the second, third day of trial or something. And what kind of finding would constitute that to be a voluntary absence if the state continues to proceed forward with the case in the absence of the defendant? There's not really any controlling law I've seen in Idaho on what the authority of the court is to override a request for a defendant to be voluntarily absent. But interestingly, as has been mentioned and argued by the state, the rule under waiving continued presence under Rule 43C1B talks about the authority a court would have to have a disruptive defendant continue to be present during trial, even if ordered by a court to, quote, bind and gag the defendant. So I think the rule contemplates that absences may occur. I think that provision of the rule also clearly indicates that the court does have the authority to order the appearance of the defendant in facing trial and proceedings and the right of the parties to have the defendant present, including the defendant's own constitutional rights. And having considered the authority and not finding any cited case law to the contrary, I do think this court has the authority to override that request of the defendant to voluntarily excuse herself from certain portions of the trial and not others, where she's been here for the first day and a half of trial. And I do find that within the court's authority to conduct this trial, her presence can and should be required in order to ensure her due process rights and also to ensure a fair trial on behalf of the state. So with that having been considered, I have carefully considered the request of the defendant in this case who is here present, and I am denying her request to excuse herself from this section of the proceedings that are occurring in the evidence presented by the state's case in chief. So that will be the court's 
ruling on that. I'll prepare a order to that effect, which will be entered into this case, and we will move forward with additional evidence to be presented in the defendant's presence. Mr. Archibald, any questions on that ruling? No, Your Honor. Does the state have any questions on the ruling? No, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Thank you, counsel. At this time, then, we'll have the jury brought back in for additional evidence. All right, please. All right. Thank you. Please be seated. All right. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we did take an inordinately long lunch break. I apologize. As you may have recalled from one of the many instructions you received when this case began, at times there are delays where we are working behind the scenes on legal issues, and that's what was occurring outside of your presence. So I wanted to give you an explanation there. We're still committed to our trial schedule for the day of when I advised you we'd be ending each day roughly. So with that in mind, we do have continued testimony from the witness who has previously been placed under oath, Detective Hermosillo. And, Mr. Wood, you can continue with your direct examination at this time. Thank you, Your Honor. Detective Hermosillo, you testified earlier about meeting Chad Daybell and Alex Cox, correct? That's correct. And you testified that you found Mr. Daybell's answer to one of your questions suspicious because you knew he was married to Lori Daybell, correct? Correct. Through your investigation, do you know when they were married? November 5th, 2019. Your Honor, I'd ask that the witness be handed what's marked as State's Exhibit 30, and it will be offered as a demonstrative exhibit. Thank you. Detective, so far throughout this trial, there have been many names and individuals listed. Did you put together a chart with associated pictures and names to aid the jury in understanding your testimony? I did. And did you do that to also help the jury keep track of the numerous individuals in this case? Yes. Can you look at State's Exhibit 30? What does that purport to be? The exhibit I created with the various names and pictures. Okay. 
And are those uh, names matched to the pictures? Yes. Of the individuals who they purport to be? Yes. Um, Your Honor, for demonstrative purposes and to aid the jury, I'd ask the State's Exhibit 30 be entered into evidence. Any objection? I've not received Exhibit 30. I have 31 and 30, 31A and 31B. For demonstrative purposes, we have no objection to 30. All right, thank you, Mr. Thomas. Uh, exhibit 30 can be admitted for demonstrative purposes. Thank you, Your Honor. May I publish that to the jury? Yes, you may. Detective, who do you observe on State's Exhibit 30? Lori Vallo Daybell. And then, actually, I'm going to stop you. Can you use the pointer and point to who you're talking about? Lori Vallo Daybell, Charles Vallo, Alex Cox, Chad Daybell, Tammy Daybell, Tylee Ryan, Joshua J.J. Vallo. And Melanie Pulowski, also known as Melanie Boudreaux. Okay. Your Honor, I'd also ask that the witness be handed State's Exhibits 31A and 31B. These will also be offered for demonstrative purposes. Detective, do you recognize State's Exhibits 31A and 31B? I do. Okay. Uh, there have been many dates and events discussed thus far. Did you put together a chart of times and events to aid the jury in understanding your testimony and tracking the dates and times discussed? Yes, I did. Is that what uh, State's Exhibits 31A and 31B are? Yes, it is. Are the, uh, are the dates and times and the uh, individuals listed there, uh, true and accurate representations of what have been testified to so far? Yes. Your Honor, the state would, uh, for demonstrative purposes, ask for the admission of State's Exhibits 31A and 31B. All right. Uh, let's start with 31A. Is there any objection to the admission of that as a demonstrative exhibit? No. 31A will be admitted. And as to 31B, any objection? No. 31B is also admitted as a demonstrative exhibit. May I publish those to the jury, Your Honor? You may. Detective, similarly, can you use your pointer and um, Point out what you observe on State's Exhibit 30, 31A. July 11th, 2019 is the day that Charles Vallow dies. September 2nd or 3rd, uh, Lori, Alex, Tylee, and JJ moved to Rexburg, Idaho. Last known proof of life for Tylee Ryan was September 8th, 2019. Last known proof of life for J.J. Vallow was September 22nd, 2019. October 2nd, 2019 was the attempted shooting of Brandon Boudreaux. October 9th, 2019 was the attempted shooting of Tammy Daybell. October 19th, 2019 is the day that Tammy dies. Similarly, 
Detective, can you point out what you observe on State's Exhibit 31B? 31B is the, the key dates of the investigation we had spoken about earlier. November 1st, 2019 is the day I was contacted by Fremont County. November 4th, 2019 is the day that I seized the 2018 Jeep Wrangler. November 5th, 2019 is the date that Chad and Lori were married in Kauai. November 25th, 2019 is the day that I was requested to do a welfare check on J.J. Vallow. November 26, 2019 is the date that I contacted Alex Cox and Chad Daybell outside of that residence. November 27, 2019 was the date we executed the search warrant at Lori Vallow's residence. June 9th, 2020 was the day we executed the search warrant at Chad Daybell's residence. <clears throat> and June 10th is the day we went to the Ada County Coroner's office. Thank you. Your Honor, I'd ask that the witness be handed state, uh, state's exhibits 11A through 11G. Detective, do you recognize those exhibits? <clears throat> I do. What do they purport to be? They are the photographs of the pet cemetery and the burial site that we later located, uh, Tylee Ryan. Okay, is this the same area you testified, or is this the same pet cemetery area you testified to earlier today? Yes. Okay. And uh, this is something you saw with your own eyes? Yes. Uh, and you saw this on June 9th and June 10th, 2020? Yes, that's correct. Um, Your Honor, I'd ask that state's exhibits uh, 11B I'd ask the state's exhibits 11A through 11G be entered into evidence. All right. Any objection to any of those exhibits from the defense? If I have just a second, Judge. You may. No objection. Okay. Uh, just to keep the record clear, exhibits <coughs> states 11A. 11B, 11C, 11D, 11E, 11F, and 11G have all been admitted and may be published. Detective, can you describe what you observed in State's Exhibit 11A? This is the 
pet cemetery. Uh, as I earlier testified, we knew it was the pet cemetery because of the black dog statue that was next to the post. Detective, uh, can you, with the pointer, point out the black dog? Sorry. Right there. Thank you. <clears throat> also in this photograph is the fire pit that is sectioned off that we were also going through and the blue tarps, anything of interest or evidentiary value that we uh, dug out of the ground were placed on the blue tarps. Thank you. Detective, can you describe what you observed in States Exhibit 11B? As I testified earlier, when we began digging down, we could notice the difference in soil uh, from dry soil to a moist soil, and we started to, to get into clumps of, of rotted flesh, charred flesh, um, and, and this is starting to get down into the rotted flesh and the charred flesh. There's a piece of broken charred bone sticking up through the dirt, um, and that's, that's what that photograph is. Can you describe what you observed in State's Exhibit 11C? Sorry, maybe that's faster. As we began digging down and, and this, the flesh and bone began coming out of the ground. We would, we had our, our rubber gloves on, grab it out of the ground and place it on the blue tarp that I described earlier. Um, this is just a portion of some of the flesh and, and charred bone, broken bone that we had uncovered at that time. It still has some dirt on the, on the charred flesh, but there's bone fragments, there's some more bone fragments, some bone there, and the rotted charred flesh that was attached to that bone. Detective, what did you observe in State's Exhibit 11D? <clears throat> when I testified earlier about the mass, the, the, the clump of, of flesh and bone that was placed into the melted green bucket, um, that's what you're looking at here. Y you can see the, the part of the plastic green bucket um, there's parts of bone sticking out here. Um, this area here is all uh, burnt flesh, um, fatty tissue. There's organs that weren't completely burnt through all the way. Um, like it was just placed in the bucket and kind of stayed there. So we dug around that bucket the best we could. Uh, we would get in there and, and dig by hand um, with, with paint brushes or anything that we can get. Uh, underneath this bucket, you can start seeing the partial remains of a human skull underneath the, the melted bucket. <clears throat> 